Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? So uh, Anthony Clarizio, who is the um, the director of Shands Home Care, is also a big uh, community advocate. And uh, when we opened our center, he came to my office and said, "You know, we're building this really cool senior center on 34th Avenue." And I said, "Boy, that's that's really far up there. You know, I got to turn up 34th and go up the street." He said, "It's going to be this huge." great center and you guys should have the programs out there for the patients and for the families and so we came out and took a look at it and this is a recently opened facility and, and Anthony raised five million dollars in this community and really did an amazing job and I think this is a beautiful facility and so we are uh, very happy to try to participate with bringing educational programs uh, to the community, to the North uh, Central Florida community, to the Parkinson patients and to movement disorders patients and just general uh, informational programs and connecting scientists to the community and so I think this is a great thing and so I just want to acknowledge Anthony and and all that he's done for this for this community I wanted to talk for uh, a few minutes this morning about uh, the idea of what we had envisioned in um, opening this center and it was many years in the making and the idea was is that we kind of wanted to change the landscape of how American health care was delivered and make it more patient centric and to uh, make it more um, focused on uh, on what uh, what is important for you as the patient every day and so that you can get access to all your services in one place but also you can get access to all of the um, exciting research and outreach and opportunities for the community and try to bring it all together. And what's really interesting about the American healthcare system is it's a great system but it's very disconnected and one of the things that we noticed um, off the bat when we came here about a decade ago was that patients were ping-ponging, you know, and so we'd send you here to see the neurosurgeon and here to see the neuropsychologist and here to see the psychiatrist and there's the social worker. And it's actually very difficult when you have um, an issue or a neurological problem to be ping-ponged from one place to another. And so the idea was to try to integrate all of these uh, missions. I also learned a very important lesson uh, when we opened the center, and, and it's almost to the day, one year, that this center opened. And we had the, the center opening on the night, and Janet Reno was, was uh, we were very humbled to have her be the uh, first patient-centric tour through the center. Um, we gave our presentation and we were talking the whole time and everybody was looking at us but the slides weren't actually coming up on the screen and it actually provided a very funny uh, moment and, uh, and I remember Dr. Foote and I looking out and we said to all the people that were there, there were like 600 people, we said, why didn't you guys tell us that there, you know, there were no slides? And they, 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 uh, they said, well, it was, it's interesting and we were having fun. So I assume there's some slides up here. <laughs> okay, I kind of like to check that uh, nowadays. Um, so this is the center. It is on um, actually on 34th Street. So it's interesting. From the senior center, it's a you know a 20 minute hop, and we're on the same street. It is a long drive with many traffic lights, um, but uh, but it's right on the edge of campus, and it is located right across the street from the University of Florida Hilton Hotel. And the idea is is for complete patient centric care. The patients that need to travel can stay at the hotel. You can log on to the website. They give you a nice you know like hundred dollar rate or something to stay in the hotel that night and we actually have patients that come from overseas and long distances to see us and this is a very a very good thing. So there are potential advantages to this type of care system. Um, interdisciplinary care we believe is the best and safest possible care for the patients and so this isn't just you see a patient and you're done or uh, multidisciplinary care where you see a patient and you write your consult and at some point the doctor might get a letter and read this and say oh that's interesting I'm glad that you saw this patient. This is what's called interdisciplinary care. It's the highest level of care. It's where all the practitioners are in the same place and actually talking behind your back, sometimes in front of you. <laughs> highest level of care. 
Now, neurologic disease patients often have t uh, difficulty traveling site to site, so that's a potential um, uh, advantage to this. It facilitates discussion between different members of the team in real time, and it speeds the response on important medical issues. So if you need to get something done, you can get it done you know, right away. You've got your facilities, you've got your imaging, you've got your swallowing, whatever needs to be done can get done. Now, preventative medicine reduces the cost of health care to society, so ultimately this idea of you checking in with therapists and getting the right plans and everything should reduce falls, should reduce pneumonia, should reduce the burden of the things that happen to us just from aging, and it facilitates best practices, and then you have access, and I remember when my dad got sick and we went around the country looking for places for him to get his treatment for his cancer, and you come in and and you want to be sure that you're in a place that you can see the whole menu of options, but get your care, but also if there's something exciting, a new vaccine, a new chemo or something, that it's there for you. And so we want to create that type of environment. This is the sign and the opening. And just to run you through this, how it works, it's very simple. Uh, patients come into the clinic, you come off the elevators on the fourth floor, there's one check-in form for all specialties. You don't keep filling out the form over and over to see each uh, specialty. As soon as you come in, you walk on this uh, gait and balance meter so we can have the researchers, Dr. Haas and colleagues and Dr. Valancourt and Dr. Christo and all those really smart guys that interface with our really smart therapists, Meredith DeFranco and Shankar and, and Lisa, and together they can begin to look at this data as it comes off of the gate right on each um, iteration and look at your balance and have you stand on the balance meter and have you cough and have Michelle Troche and Chris Sapienza and Jay Rosenbeck look at that and hopefully we'll be able to develop plans to improve your walking, reduce falling and reduce aspiration and so that's one of the goals of the center and so they come up with all sorts of cool looking things that are way too sophisticated for me to understand. Um, there's a really neat uh, state-of-the-art uh, waiting area. This was designed by the um, Emmy-winning uh, guy who scores symphonies, who's in the Digital Worlds Institute, who's one of our faculty members, James Oliverio. So when he's not scoring symphonies for Wynton Marsalis, he's designing your waiting room, <laughs> and it has this very nice uh, display that uh, that courses across the screen, and it, we're trying to make it less of a clinic feel. And he also helped us to design this national park style introduction to the center. And so when you go to a national park, you watch the movie, right? It tells you everything that's going to happen to you. And then when it happens to you, you say, oh, I know that. Oh, that's where that's supposed to be. And so he explains everything. But this also, as soon as you watch this little video that's also on the website, you can sign a consent and be part of the research process. So all your data goes into this huge database. It's one of the largest databases for movement disorders in the country. And it can help us. It can help other researchers. And we try to interface with as many people as will listen to us and work with us. All the specialties are in one location and it's completely patient-centric. So when we had our fights, it took us three years with the architect to design this, the patients got the windows. And so there's very few inside cabins here and so you get to look out and it's a, it should be a very uh, good experience uh, for you. Even the corner offices, Dr. Foote calls them the CEO offices, belong to the, uh, to the patients. The patients also um, contributed all the art that's in the center and it's quite a nice collection. Um, this is uh, really interesting because when the National Institutes of Health asks for Parkinson proposals, they put out what's called an RFA, a request for applications. We put out an RFA and have a continuous RFA called a request for art. And so Jill Sonke Henderson, who runs the Dance for Life program, which by the way, will have a program up in McGuire at 4 p.m. today. They are a beautiful dance company um, on campus and they do dancing for Parkinson program. Jill chairs this um, request for art committee and, um, and goes through and if you win a spot on the wall, you get your name up next to your art and, um, and then you can drive our nurses crazy by asking to be put into your special room with your, with your art. And, uh, and it, but it's, a, it, it's, a, it's really a great thing and it, it underscores the fact that the patients uh, own this center, that it's, it's not really ours, it's really yours. This is a nice, um, I think, self-portrait of somebody who's had surgery. The furniture is made to be so you're not talking to the computer, so the desk should be able to move, the monitor is attached to the desk, the database, the scans, you can look at your brain scan if you want to. I 
some people don't want to, but if you want to see your brain or you want to prove to your spouse that you have a brain, they can flip that around. You can see it. It's really nice. And, um, and it doesn't seem like you're talking to the, to the computer screen. All of the new drugs, the toxins, they have a big botulinum toxin practice, and um, a DBS, and duodopa, behavioral therapies, they're all there, so you, so you can ask about them. You should have access. It's a nice picture here of Chris Sapienza, and she is the chair of uh, communicative disorders, and for the last decade, she's been developing this device you can see one of our patients blowing into that prevents aspiration. You can put it in your pocket. It's now patented. It's like 20 bucks, and uh, and that's one of the things that uh, that really gets people is the development of pneumonias, and so it it, uh, it reduces that. And so we're very proud of her, and we want these types of devices to to come forward. The physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, all in one location. We like you to check in, you know, once or twice a year. Get a program if you live far away. We'll develop the program for you. You can bring it to your therapists. We want to be sure you're doing the right kind of therapy for whatever your problem is so that it's tailored for you. There's swallow studies that are on site. And if you haven't had a swallow study before, if you have Parkinson's disease, you should at some point be getting checked for your speech and your swallowing, just to be sure. And if you're coughing when you're eating, these can be signs that, um, that food's going in the wrong direction. And so we try to stay out in front of these things. If you need an MRI, it's all in the same building now. Dr. Rodriguez has been really forward thinking in developing a telemedicine program and we hope over the next five years to be able to offer links to patients so we can see you on a telemedicine link instead of see you in person if you um, come from a distance or maybe there's a, a travel issue. Uh, we also see patients from overseas and this is a great thing and Dr. Rodriguez has been giving talks and beginning to develop a program so we can give these sorts of symposium and scientific talks and make our 47 and faculty available to people that are all over Florida and all over the world for their symposiums if they have the right technology. And so I think you'll see this emerging over the next five years. Canada is the largest consumer of telemedicine in the world and the Parkinson specialists in Canada, some of them spend their entire afternoons, their entire clinic is done by telemedicine. And you remember Canada is very you know, disparate, the very diffusely um, populated, and people have to travel long distances. It actually saves the Canadian government $40 million a year that they reinvest back in their healthcare system. It's very high satisfaction for patients, and so it's something we're interested in. And we've been trying this with some of our um, interdisciplinary specialists. So if you need a social worker, uh, we want to try to maybe get you hooked up uh, instead of on the telephone. Maybe we can get you hooked up with uh, some telephone medicine links and, and to some of the therapists. And so I think this has a lot of potential. So Dr. Rodriguez is working on, on that. This is the laboratory. So all of the information that you send into the big Dr. Evil system gets pushed into this room. And then we collate that information. And Chuck Jacobson, who's running all the all the, uh, the techno stuff for us today. Uh, Chuck has been with us a long time and he's helped to design this, this really world-class um, database. And we have been working with National Parkinson to help them roll out their quality improvement initiative, which is going to be the largest living real-time database for Parkinson disease across centers of excellence all over the world. So eventually we hope to be able to tell a lot about prognosis, what to do, how to change things, which centers are, are, are doing better with patients in which areas, and, and putting this data together in a way that, that makes sense. The fellows are all here that are training, and, and they're in blue shirts, and, uh, and as well as our clinical trial staff and our other staff at the center. And we train fellows from all over the world, and we want them to go back and to open uh, centers of excellence and to be excellent. We've partnered with the Smallwood Foundation, uh, who provides funding for this effort. And the idea is to export excellence and to have centers like this set up in every community as far as we can we can reach because it's really important, uh, especially with the, with the numbers of patients that are coming down with Parkinson's disease and related disorders over the next 
decade, this is really becoming an epidemic. And so the idea of training and addressing the critical shortage is, is important. And finally, the clinical trials uh, coordination center is on site. So Stacy Merritt and her um, staff are here and waving you down in the parking lot, making sure you park in the right place. But they will also be sure that if you want to be involved in a clinical trial, that you understand what that means and also what trials are available and what might be appropriate for you or what might be coming uh, forward. And so we encourage you to interface with the staff and, and, um, and this could be an opportunity for you during your, your care. So, like I said, it was about a year ago that we um, we opened this uh, this center, and uh, we're very humbled to um, to have been um, part of your lives and part of the community here and the greater Parkinson uh, community. Uh, we do believe that switching to a patient-centric uh, model will deliver better care. Uh, it makes patients uh, feel more satisfied. It makes you feel better and more secure about your lives. It considers a whole picture, not just a piece of a picture. Remember that it's preventative. There's cost savings, and cost savings should translate to the entire healthcare system and also with research opportunities. So we think this makes a whole lot of practical sense, and we believe that this hasn't happened before because it makes too much sense. Because you know, if it makes too much sense, you know, nobody actually does it. And so we thought, well, this is actually pretty easy. This, this, this actually the whole picture fits together, and the puzzle makes a lot of sense. And so, so we should do this. And so